Good day and thank you for joining us for a very special edition of The Front Page. I'm your host, Racing Post editor Tom Kerr. Over recent months, The Racing Post has spent a great deal of time scrutinising affordability checks. These, of course, are the most consequential change to gambling regulation in Britain for decades. Their introduction threatens to devastate racing's funding and to drive many thousands of racing bettors to the black market or away from the regulated market. Ever since the checks were first proposed in the white paper, the government and the Gambling Commission have sought to downplay the impact they will have on consumers and on racing, insisting that they will only affect a very small percentage of punters, that the checks will be frictionless and that the damage to racing will be limited. But experts and those within the sport have warned repeatedly that some of these claims and promises do not stand up to scrutiny. So what is the truth? Over the last week, the Racing Post ran a series of special reports scrutinising the key claims made by the government and the Gambling Commission in the white paper and the current consultation on affordability checks. And I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by the authors of those special reports, senior writer Lee Mortised and industry editor Bill Barber. Welcome both. Thanks, so. We will start with the first piece that we wrote, which scrutinised one of the most important claims about affordability checks. And this is the claim that only a very small number of bettors will ever encounter the checks. And I'll quote here the gambling minister, Stuart Andrew, who said in the pages of the Racing Post, eight out of 10 players will face no checks at all. And only about 3% of the highest spending accounts will ever have more detailed checks. This number, this 3% number, has been cited repeatedly by DCMS, by government, and by the Gambling Commission to stress the limited reach and impact of affordability checks. Lee, you looked into this number, and I suppose that the, the, the starting point that uh, we have repeated countless times, and that punters have told us countless times, is that in many ways this number is actually academic because the Gambling Commission and DCMS choose to focus purely on what is going to happen in the future, whereas, as we know and as punters know, thousands and upon thousands of bettors have already been confronted with affordability checks. Yeah, I think you can take you can break this down into, into three sections, Tom. One, where we are already in terms of affordability checks. Two how that 3% figure was reached, and three, why the 3% figure is almost irrelevant anyway. The first point you raise is that, to an extent, this is a, a door being closed long after the horse has bolted. The 3% figure is a future projection for what uh, the, the impact of enhanced checks will be once affordability checks are formally brought into the landscape. The reality, of course, is that affordability checks are already there. They're already significant and their scope is already massively beyond that which the, the white paper predicts for the future. For over two years now, mm. punters have been significantly impacted by affordability checks online punters, but also betting shop punters as well. Um, for over two years now, punters have been finding that bookmakers are asking them to present financial documents, personal financial documents, pay slips, P60s, in some cases, even more than that, mm. if they are to be allowed to continue betting. Um, we spoke in the, in the piece to, to William Woodham, the chief exec of Fitzdares, who spoke about 50% of his new clients are not agreeing to submit checks. We had a survey of punters earlier in the year, which showed that not far short of one in five punters had already experienced affordability checks. Yeah. And we know that not only is this impacting individual punters, it is impacting horse racing because as we've reported many times and everybody knows, betting and horse racing are commercially and financially 
inextricably linked. If punters are not betting, if they're moving away from betting, if they're going to the black market, as you highlighted earlier, that will consequently have an impact on horse racing. So even before you get to the the 3% projection for the future, affordability checks are a thing in the present. And this causes a huge amount of frustration for punters. It causes a huge amount of frustration, frankly, uh, for us reporting on it because we are in the difficult position of simultaneously talking about a new piece of uh, regulation and the form it will take while also confronting the reality that the proposal that is being uh, consulted upon is basically already in existence. Now, nonetheless though, our piece is focused on this forthcoming regulation. We, we certainly wanted to make clear that affordability checks are not hypothetical, they are real and they have already affected um, by all indications far more than 3% of racing punters. However, What's being consulted on by, by the Gambling Commission and what was proposed in the white paper is the future shape of uh, affordability checks and the future shape of regulation around betting. So that is what we've mainly focused on in our pieces. Then we took this 3% figure. This is, a, this is the idea that only 3% of the most active accounts will be confronted with enhanced checks. Uh, we, we, we very quickly found that even on a, the most basic mathematical level, uh, there were issues with that number. Yeah, completely. So if you look at how um, the 3% the figure was arrived at in the, in the white paper, the, the gambling commission, the gambling industry sector regulator, um, requested from bookmakers data that it could use to make predictions, projections, estimates for the government to use in the white paper. Almost six million betting accounts were used. And from those accounts, the Gambling Commission sought to um, uh, predict with, with the government how many accounts would hit the two thresholds that are key to enhance checks, what we consider to be proper, meaningful, serious affordability checks. There is uh, one threshold whereby uh, when punters spend uh, or have a net loss of £2,000 over a course of 90 days and the second one is a net loss of £1,000 in 24 hours. Those two cohorts, cohorts were, were assessed separately. The first one, um, the, the, the figures that the, the Gambling Commission got from bookmakers suggested that 3.2% of accounts, of active accounts, of accounts in which one bet, if you like, had been placed in the course of a year, 3.2% of accounts had hit that £2,000 net loss in 90 days threshold. Mm. The data showed that 2.0% of accounts had hit the £1,000 in 24 days threshold. So you have two separate cohorts, one showing 3.2%, one showing 2.0%. How, therefore, do we get a 3% estimate? Because I wasn't great at maths, but I know 3.2% at 2.0 equals 5.2. You can, of course, argue, and quite rightly, that it wouldn't be simple as adding 3.2 at 2.0 because there would be crossover. Some of the people who spend 1,000 pounds in, in 24 hours are also going to spend 2,000 pounds in that Exactly that. that. It stands to reason that would be the case. Logic dictates that. But the reverse must surely be true. The reverse must be true. You can't. You cannot have total crossover. And in fact, the 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 government accepts that there can't be total crossover. And yet, we have a situation where 3.2 add 2.0 doesn't only equal 3.2; it equals 3.0. So you have a situation whereby the estimate, the number of accounts that will be hit by enhanced checks, is actually lower than the, the most significant of the two cohorts. Now, I, in the, in the process of working through this piece, asked both the Gambling Commission and the DCMS to tell me how 3.2 at 2.0 equals 3.0. The, the, the Gambling Commission, um, in effect, referenced the fact that it had used data brought forward from bookmakers, 3% figure was reached. If you want to know any more, ask the DCMS. So I then went to the DCMS, whose answer was akin to telling me what I had already asked 
in the question, i.e. it was a very Sir Humphrey Appleby type answer that didn't answer the question. And this is pivotal because, as we've said all along, the 3% prediction is central to the government's strategy and its communications. And if the government and its gambling industry regulator are unable to explain how it actually reached a 3.0% figure, then there is no foundation mm. for that figure. And it immediately um, reduces any confidence anyone can have in what they're doing. Let's move on to the next issue with this. Um, Bill, the number is based on the definition of an active account. Now, explain where, why that raises issues when the gambling minister, for example, is telling Racing Post readers that only 3% of them will ever be confronted by affordability checks. Well, the, the, the main issue is that the definition of an active account is um, an account that could, could have had as, as little as one bet in a year. Mm. And um, th if you, th th there's a, a study called Patterns of Play that I'm, sh I'm sure we'll, we'll mention later. If you look at the Patterns of Play data, there's, there's quite a large percentage of accounts only have one bet a year, presumably on the Grand National or, or on the Premier League or something, it's something like 20%. Mm. And even going up to just five bets a year, you, 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 that's a pretty significant chunk of, of accounts. So when they say it's, it's 3% of, of active accounts, you, 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 they're completely underestimating the number of actual committed bettors. Yeah. And um, so when it comes to racing and committed, committed bettors, the people who help fund the sport, it's going to be considerably more than 3%. It's, um, we, we, we can't say what no, the percentage no, will be ultimately because this has not been assessed. They mm. did not assess what percentage of people who are active monthly mm. will be affected by this. The other element to do with an active account uh, which was raised in, in the series was that for many racing punters, um, you do not have a betting account, you have betting accounts. Mm. And therefore, if 3% of accounts are affected, that does not correspond to 3% of punters affected, mm. but rather 3% of accounts. So for those who have multiple accounts, the probability of being affected increases once again. Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's somewhat disingenuous um, of those saying it's only going to be 3%. And it's, the other thing that has struck me uh, in the debate over this is that it's <clears throat> this, it is not being presented by some of the people, some people, and uh, the gambling commission would be at the top of the list. It's not being um, presented as an estimate. It's being presented as a, a fact, and a mm. fact that therefore you cannot be argued or challenged. And um, it, that's more than frustrating. It, you know, these are these are estimates based on checks that, in some cases, don't actually exist yet. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, just to present this as this is a fact and it can't be challenged, is, um, it, well, it's, I mean, it's dangerous to the horse racing industry, for starters. It's well, dangerous to punters and it's dangerous to horse racing. And on that danger to the horse racing industry, the, 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 the third, if you like, chunk of, I think, the, the real concern about the 3% the, the figure is that in terms of horse racing, 3% is largely irrelevant. We, we know it's going to be more than 3%. But we also know that the percentage of people who regularly bet on horse racing who will be impacted by this will be far greater than 3%. So again, Will Woodhams of, of Fitzdares, he made um, the point that of his client base, and it is not a, a client base that is reflective of the industry. He would say that himself. They are um, a very heavily racing-based bookmaker and a bookmaker of high net worth clients, you know, they, mm. they, theirs are the punters that do tend to have proper meaty bets. But he reckoned of his clients, 80% of his punters yeah. would trigger uh, enhanced checks. He said across the industry as a whole, he forecast 20 to 40%. But he also made the point that it's what is key is who the punters are that are going to trigger checks. And quite obviously, it is punters who stake 
the most. His view is that it's going to be £50 plus punters who will be most impacted. And he went on to explain how they are key yeah. to racing funding. Racing, if you're watching this and you're somebody who likes a, a £1 treble on ITV Racing every Saturday, that's fantastic. But with the best one in the world, you are not making a massive contribution to the funding of horse racing. Those who stake more, obviously, contribute more. And those punters are the ones who are going to be impacted by enhanced checks. Those are the ones who are going to be faced with a decision. Do I hand over personal financial documents? Do I say, well, look, this is something I enjoy doing, but I don't need to do it, so I'm going to stop doing it. Or do I go to the black market? Mm. And Will makes the point that those key punters, those high staking punters who are going to be most impacted by this, are the ones who contribute around 90% of racing's media rights income. So again, for, for horse racing, this is of colossal importance. The, the Gambling Commission has stated on the record that it doesn't really have much interest in that, and to an extent you can see why. It's the gambling industry regulator. Its job isn't to look after horse racing, but the government does have a job to look after horse racing. It has stated that it, had, it wants mm. to do no damage to horse racing. Rishi Sunak said that at the Thoroughbred Industry Awards earlier in the year. But again, as I said in the column today, actions speak louder than words, even if those actions are wholly unintended. Absolutely, and this leads us on to the second part in our series. Um, if we have established that the 3% figure is based on some questionable uh, mathematics and also uh, is of dubious or indeed little to no relevance to racing punters, then it moves on to the nature of the checks themselves. These are the, the, the affordability checks that punters are going to be confronted with. And in the white paper and ever since, government has promised that these checks for the vast majority would be frictionless. And by frictionless they mean they will happen largely or entirely in the background and cause minimal to no inconvenience to punters. The idea being that whereas existing affordability checks where individuals have to send in sensitive financial de uh, documentation with a very high level of people refusing to do so, uh, will be streamlined and therefore compliance will go up enormously and the impact on uh, betting and racing and punters will be significantly diminished. Now, in theory, of course, this is an excellent uh, middle ground. This is, this is something that will significantly mitigate the impact of affordability checks on both individuals and the industries reliant on betting. However, our investigation has raised a lot of questions about how these frictionless checks might work in practice. Yeah, they don't know how to do it. I mean, that is ultimately the key. Um, for, for, the, for, the, for the government, frictionless, again, has been a key thrust of its communications message. Um, Stuart Andrew, the, the gambling minister, has repeated that. He said it in a Racing Post column earlier in the year. He has said it um, to parliamentarians in the DCMS Select Committee. And their, their theory, um, their assumption, and so much of this whole white paper is based on assumptions. Their assumptions are that credit reference agencies um, will be pivotal to all this, that um, a system um, based on credit account turnover details will be very useful in, in uh, ensuring that bookmakers can do all this without uh, interfering with customers. They believe, they're assuming, in effect, that the, the software, the technology already exists to do this. Now it, sh it should be said, though, in the white paper, when it was published in April, uh, it, it, it very sort of clearly uh, implied that the, the, the solution did not exist at this yeah. point. It basically said, we're going to work with the financial services sector to work out how frictionless checks could be enabled. Ever since then, government, gambling commission have repeatedly stated the checks will be frictionless. This is a promise, yeah. the checks will be frictionless. However, at no point has there been any light shared on how this hitherto uh, non-existent technology, non-existent form of check will actually work 
in practice. And that's a fundamental thing. And the Gambling Commission um, you know, recently uh, took, has taken issue with the Racing Post reporting on this, and it has stated, once again, that checks will be frictionless without, once again, providing any detail about how it will. And we spoke to a wide range of uh, lawyers and gambling industry analysts, all of whom, I think it's correct to say, all of whom stated that they were unclear how these frictionless checks would, would work in practice. Yeah, Tom, I, I, I can state here now that I will have a perfect flat six pack in six weeks time. Unless I can show you how I'm going to do it, it's largely irrelevant. If I'm having a cream cake mm. every day, it's not gonna happen. It's fine for the government and the gambling commission to say, these will be frictionless. They don't know how to do it. I, Bill and I, we sat in the, in the committee room, uh, the DCMS committee room, where Stuart Andrew, the gambling minister, was asked, how will these checks be frictionless? And his response was, that's what we're consulting on at the moment. In effect, what the government has done is it's signed up to buy a very expensive house without having any knowledge of how it's going to pay for it. It's committed itself yeah. to a goal, to an outcome, it's gone as far as creating a legislative process and it doesn't know how to do it. So what, what do we know? We do know that in the consultation, yeah. they talk about credit reference agencies providing data such as an estimate of overall disposable income and they talk about current account turnover, yeah. Cato, this yeah. is a data set held by credit reference agencies. Um, there's significant doubts about whether what the gambling commission says bookmakers need to know yeah. about individuals finances can be provided by cato or by credit reference agencies generally completely so for a start cato doesn't um doesn't incorporate doesn't bring in three out of ten um accounts so th for, for, for those people it's not signed up to no it would, wouldn't be would, can't can't help at all yeah. but then for those where it is uh, relevant, where it is a factor, what it tells you is how much money goes into an account. It tells you what's what's coming in. It doesn't in effect, it, it tells you, you know, what what your income is, if you like. For it, it doesn't tell you um, what's going out, wh wh where the money's coming from. It, it doesn't give you the details. It gives you a bare figure. For for a, for a whole chunk of people, not least those. Um, who aren't betting based on a regular weekly, monthly income, it's therefore irrelevant. For a lot of the, the key racing punting demographic, the, the older people, um, again, it would be largely irrelevant. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's something that, um, yes, it, it, it's there, but it's not a solid foundation on which to build this house. And one last thing on this, I know people are probably sick to death of hearing about credit reference checks and so yep. forth, but this is a very important point. Will the use of credit reference agency checks result in people having difficulty borrowing money in future because of marks left on their files by the checks that bookmakers carry out? Very possibly, yeah. So again, we spoke to lots of uh, lawyers and experts in the sector and their their view was that almost certainly it would do yes. Now again, the the gambling commission has said no, that, that won't happen, it's not a concern. But they don't say how, they don't say why, they don't explain. As, as Bill was saying earlier on, they present something as fact in a way that Donald Trump presented things as fact when he was present and he is doing now but there's no substance behind mm -hmm. the fact. If, you, if, if they know how things are going to be done, then tell us. You know, when we ask questions, give us detailed answers. Yeah. Don't just repeat what they've said before. And, and this is an important point to make as well, um, because as, as I mentioned before, the Gambling Commission has said the Racing Post is in balance. It suggested that our coverage is, is creating misunderstandings and misleading uh, racing customers. Bill, how many times have we put these questions to the Gambling Commission? How many times have we offered them the opportunity to provide clarity around simple uh, factual questions? These are not questions of ideology or principle. It's about mechanics. And we have gone to them time and time again and said, can you shed, us light, shed light on this? Will you speak to us on these topics? And what is the response? 
um, I mean, <clears throat> we, we've been to them on several occasions, and um, the response tends to be everything's in the consultation, everything's in the white paper. Um, there's been, uh, and it, it's basically computer says no. They, 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 they will not expand. They've just said it's all out there. Um, read it and you'll, you'll, um, you'll find out. That's basically been the, the response all along. Why is this important, Lee? Um, why is it important whether checks are, fr are frictionless or whether people end up having to provide documentation? Well, I mean, the key thing, Tom, is that if the checks aren't frictionless, if they're not going on in the background without us having to do anything, a lot of people, when faced with the question, will you, in effect, when Butmer can say to them, listen, uh, will you help us out here by providing that P60, that, that uh, bank account, your mortgage statement, if, they're ha if people are having to do that, a lot of those people will not go along with the process. We know that because they're already not going along with the process. We know that from the survey that we've done, we know that from what Bookmaker is saying, we know that from what Will Woodhams is saying. Yeah. If people are asked to actually physically do something, to actually divulge, some of their personal financial information, the sort of information that they would normally only expect to have to divulge if they're um, applying for a mortgage or looking to do a new rent agreement. If they're asked to do that, in effect to carry on simply with a hobby, with a pastime, they will very often say no. And we know that because they're already saying no. And that is of enormous consequence, not only for those individuals, but as I said all along, for the racing industry. In the final part of our series, we assessed what the impact on racing for, uh, of affordability checks would be. Stuart Andrew, the Minister of Responsibility for Stuart Sport and Gambling, uh, he wrote in the, in the Racing Post earlier this year, um, I said in April the white paper's impact on the sport would be minimal, and I stand by this. Um, in the, in the white paper itself, the DCMS estimated the damage to the sport in the first year would be between 8.4 and 14.9 million pounds. Not an inconsiderable sum, but for a sport like racing within the sort of yearly fluctuation that does not cause existential issues or even necessarily have that pronounced an impact on things such as prize money. Now the DCMS's impact assessment was made up of three elements, uh, a five to eight million reduction in the levy, a three to six million reduction in media rights and the balance comprising a reduction in sponsorship. Uh, Bill, we assessed this number, we scrutinised it, we spoke to a, a wide range of experts. It's fair to say there are a number of issues, some of them very fundamental. Um, the most obvious, the most glaring is that, that DCMS appear to have completely misunderstood how media rights work in racing. Yes, absolutely. Um, when the, the white paper came out, it had this impact assessment on, uh, of the checks on racing. And you looked at the, the 14.9 million figure, <coughs> excuse me, and you, your eyebrows were raised because this was nothing like the, the amount that um, figures in racing had said that the checks that are already in place were having on having on the sport. Um, and then when you when you look at the, the split between levy, media rights and, and sponsorship that you mentioned, and you in the white paper you look at how they, they worked it out, you're immediately thinking this this doesn't make sense, this isn't logical. Because the white paper itself says that sets out racing's different income streams and it says that the levy um, provides, I think, 6% of racing's income and media rights, 11%. And yet in the impact assessment, um, the impact on levy is much greater than media rights. And immediately thinking, well, how that doesn't make sense, it isn't logical. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's probably rare for a journalist, but um, in, in the government's defence, um, the white papers took so long to do, the, um, the way that me media rights have uh, 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 a base, their, their basis has, has changed and it's, it, it would appear that the government has been using the wrong basis for media rights. Um, they used to be based on a sort of a stream basis, 
and now they're based on turnover. So anything, if you've got checks that affect the amount that people bet, that's going to have a, an effect on turnover. So it, does, it, it isn't logical for, for media rights to, for the impact on media rights of the checks to be half of what it is on, on the levy. It should be a lot more. When I spoke to, to, to um, Paul Ayland of, of Regulus Partners, who are a uh, very well respected uh, industry analyst group, and he, he basically said that rather than um, three to six million, even just on the, the basis that the DCMS used, the impact could be 20 million. So already you're looking at assuming that the impact on levy and sponsorship are as the DCMS says, you're looking at approaching 30 million for the impact on, on horse racing. And, and DCMS has effectively admitted it's redoing its sums here. Yes, so I, as part of my piece, I contacted the DCMS and said, how did you work out this figure? And they basically said, well, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we decided that, that uh, the, the impact on media rights would not be at the same proportionate rate as the, as the levy. But they did say, we are, um, we are looking at finding out the latest figures for the financial impact, because this is all part of the, the work that's being done on the levy. Mm. Um, levy they, at the same time the white paper came out, the government report said it would, um, it would look at levy reform to make sure that racing's uh, income from betting wasn't damaged. Um, um, so they're looking at this figure again in terms of, the, of, of levy reform. So basically uh, uh, an admission there that, that the, the number is likely an underestimate. Mm. Now, the misunderstanding of how media rights work, issue number one, and very clearly problematic in terms of calculating that 14.9 million figure. Issue number two, I think, is no less uh, troublesome because this pertains to how they worked out what the reduction um, in racing's income from gambling uh, would be based on a reduction in gross gambling yield, i.e. The, the profits made from gambling uh, across the industry. Tell us, tell us where the issue lies here. So basically they've um, come up with a figure uh, uh, or a, a reduction in, the, in gross gambling yield for the entire industry from these checks of 6 to 11 percent. Um, and that's all gambling, eh? gambling on absolutely everything from slot machines to to uh, greyhounds, to football, whatever. Yeah, and so they've applied that to the, to uh, a figure for racing's gross gambling yield to work out how much that would hit levy and and, and sponsorship as well. I think, but it that sort of ignores the fact that racing is, is has a different uh, clientele and it has a different um, makeup to other forms of gambling. And this goes back to the Patterns of Play report that, that I mentioned earlier, which was um, com compiled by amongst others, um, Professor David Forrest and Professor Ian McHale from the University of Liverpool. Now, last year, myself and Lee were at a, an, a, an event at which Professor Forrest spoke, and he, um, he, he gave details about how racing's, uh, about basically racing's um, demographics. And racing compared to other sports has um, a much older um, uh, demographic. So you've got, you're going to have people there who, uh, a lot of, you know, there'll be retired people there betting for, uh, using savings and assets rather than, than um, salary. So they're more like likely to, to have to prove yes. income by submitting uh, documents rather than if frictionless checks do work in some capacity they're much less likely to work for that call. Absolutely. And then um, compared to, say, football, the, uh, in terms of both volume and in terms of um, profits, the, the top 1% of, of racing uh, punters provides a, a quite a startling. And, uh, I, I have the numbers here. It's the, the top 1% of horse racing bettors provided 59% of total stakes and 52% of gross gambling yield, and 76% of revenue came from just 5% of bettors. 
So even if you apply the 3% figure onto that model, you have 3% accounting for well over half mm. of racing's revenue in terms of the customers affected. Yes, I mean, it's basically, racing by its very nature has, has more high-staking punters. Football, you're going to have a lot of um, £5 accumulator bets um, on, a, on a Saturday. Yeah. Uh, and Will Woodham's put this um, very uh, succinctly in his quotes when he said, unless racing is going to go out and find three million people willing to put a five pound acre on on a Saturday, then it is going to be very heavily affected by these proposals. Absolutely. Now, obviously, we want as many people betting on, on horse racing as, 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 as we can, but that's going to take a while. And so the summary then is that the impact assessment is based on a questionable 3% figure, frictionless assertions which have yet to be proven, a misunderstanding of media rights, and then a one-size-fits-all uh, reduction in gambling yield when racing is completely different mm. to many of the other types of gambling assessed. Yes, it's, there's a, there are a combination of factors here which, which when brought together and looked at, just I, I think it's, it's very easy to argue that the, the impact on racing is going to be much greater than, than is contained in the white paper. Yet I think th three times as much as the 14.9 million is, I think is, is a, a reasonable uh, assumption. Um, since we published these pieces, Lee, what's been the reaction from within racing and, um, and beyond? Um, racing has been pretty quiet throughout this whole process publicly. Now, obviously, I, I, I'm not privy to what's going on behind the scenes, and we are told that, that there's lots of communication lots of lots of dialogue um, but publicly racing has been pretty quiet bookmakers have been pretty quiet through this process publicly um, I can't tell you how hard it was to get anyone within the bookmaking industry to talk off the record let alone on the record so thank heavens for, for, for Will Woodhams um, there might be any number of reasons why that is the case. Some might just not realise how significant this is. Um, some uh, will have this terror of the gambling commission, certainly within the bookmaking industry that we've heard about in the past. And I think some will be tippy-toeing around government in particular, not wanting to upset or annoy government at a, a delicate time. But the reality is that there isn't really much of a public campaign on this outside of what the, the media and principally the racing posts are doing. And I think that in itself is a matter of great concern. The one other group we should absolutely acknowledge that is extremely vocal on this is racing punters. Absolutely. Well, I. Um, I've been here for um, many summers and a lot more winters, and I have never known as much reader feedback on this than there has been on this subject. Um, our emails are full of it every day. Um, they are largely singing with one voice. They are enormously energized by them, principally, I think, because it is already happening to them. They are already experiencing it. This is not some theoretical future problem. This is in the here and now, and it promises to get worse. And these are people who, in some cases for decades, have enjoyed betting on horse racing as a perfectly legal, honourable and pleasurable activity. And I think those people are not only offended that the state in effect is saying to them can you prove to us that you can afford to do this but they are utterly bewildered and perplexed as to why it's happening 
And, and Bill, just finally, one of the most frustrating things about this is that over the last few months, we have been amplifying those concerns. We have been raising areas of uncertainty, of confusion, or, or, or of, or, of, of issues with calculations or proposals that seem more theoretical than uh, based in reality. The engagement, I touched on this before, but the engagement with those concerns, the concerns of punters, the concerns of racing, and, and even just questions of process, practical fact, has just been extremely wanting. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, it's, it's, it's very frustrating that basically the, the response to uh, questions and challenges has, has been that these are, this is, this is all facts, we're just, this isn't about the, this, we're consulting about how we're going to do this, there's, um, there's, these are facts and any challenge to these is, is, is almost an affront to, um, to simply believe us. Yes, absolutely. Why don't you just simply believe yes, us? Yes, absolutely. That's you know, trust yeah. us. This, these are these are facts, and um, anybody you know, you're, you're trying to undermine the government's policy. It, it was uh, it was one line I, I saw of critics of this of this area. Um, it's it's yeah, it's it's very frustrating. It's bewildering, but it's, it's deeply worrying as well. Absolutely. Um, Lee, Bill, thank you both very much. Um, excellent pieces and we will link to them in the description so please do give them a read if you haven't already seen them. Um, as it is well known to the Gambling Commission, there is a standing invitation for Chief Executive Andrew Rhodes to speak to the Racing Post. I would love to have him on this show for an unedited question and answer exchange where we can shed some light on these proposals and particularly the matters of process which uh, we've highlighted on today's show. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and joining us. We'll be back again next week with a discussion of all the big racing stories. But until then, goodbye.